Basically, I'm a sports law and business professional. I graduated from Symbiosis Law School, where I studied both law and business administration. It was a five years course. And when I was in my last semester of college, uh, I got a job offer from a rights management company in Bangalore. Uh, this is the same company with whom I interned twice. They liked my work, so they hired me. And this company basically worked in rights management and most of their clients were was, was sporting running bodies. Uh, so I worked there for two years. It was great. I worked with some really uh, good people, inspiring people. Uh, and then I came back to Pune and I worked with my brother. He has a sports equipment and gear shop. Uh, and he also sells sports equipment and gear through e-commerce platforms. Uh, so I was uh, with him for almost one year. And when I was doing this, I realized I wanted to learn more about sports management, sports business side of things. And that's when I decided to go to Europe and I started. So my first year was in Paris uh, and in my second year I went to their London campus. I just came back from London. Uh, I'm in my semester four currently. I'm uh, writing my master's thesis and while going uh, with all of this, I just started my own sports management firm called Earner Sports Management. I will talk about all of this uh, in my presentation. So please, uh, I'm going to switch this off now and I'm going to share another link. So please join me on that link. Okay. Thank you so much. See you there. Bye-bye. Okay, guys. Good evening. I'm going to talk about introduction to sports law with special reference to tennis. At any point of time, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment and then I will try to answer them once I'm done with this presentation. If you do not finish anything today, uh, you can just write me an email and then I will answer you. All right. Uh, so let's start with aim of this webinar. Uh, aim of this webinar is for making viewers get an idea of what sports law is. So by the end of this webinar, if you know more than what you knew yesterday, I will be more than happy. So I'm going to start with my introduction first. Uh, for those who missed the previous video, uh, I went to Symbiosis Law School. I was there for five years. I have a bachelor's dual degree in law and business administration. When I was in my last semester of college, uh, I got a job offer from a rights management company in Bangalore. This is the same company where I had interned twice before. They liked my work, so they hired me. Uh, I also worked with their sister organization called the Sports Law and Policy Center. It's a think tank. I had a great two years in Bangalore. I worked with like some really nice and inspiring people. And after my tenure got over in Bangalore, I came back to Pune. Uh, in Pune, I worked at Ayut Sports. Ayut Sports is my brother's company. Uh, it's a sporting goods and gear company. Uh, we have a physical shop in Baner in Pune. And we also sell sports equipment gear through e-commerce channels such as Amazon.com and Flipkart. And when I was at IU Sports, I realized I wanted to learn more about uh, sports business and sports management, uh, management side of things. And that's when I decided to go and study at Amos Sport Business School. A lot of people ask me, why did I choose to go to Amos? Uh, that's simply because, uh, or like why Europe basically. So the reason was my favorite sports are tennis and football and uh, Europe has in Europe, uh, football and tennis are very popular. Uh, I didn't think of North America because in North America, if you go to a college in US or Canada, most of the studies are focused on baseball, ice hockey, uh, sports, which I wasn't really interested in. So that's the reason to choose Amos and Europe. All right, uh, that's it about me. Uh, so let's just dive into sports law. What is sports law? It is a broad area of law related to sporting activities. It compromises various areas of law, such as torts. So torts are civil wrongs. Uh, then there's contract law. Contract law is basically any agreement that is enforceable by the law. That would be contract law. Then of course, there's company law. Company law is something where you have rules and regulations uh, about how to start a company or how to organize it. Then of course, there are anti-doping regulations. If an athlete is taking performance enhancing drugs, which are not permitted, that would come under anti-doping violation. And then of course, there are laws related to intellectual property. So when I dealt with intellectual property, it was mainly related to copyright and trademark. So I will just talk about copyright and trademark. But of course, there are patents and there's a lot more intellectual property. Uh, the most important thing to know about sports law is sports law is not codified. 
for example in india indian penal code which is known as ipc and criminal procedure code which is known as crpc are legislations that compile provisions for criminal law in india it is not the same for sports law in india so any sports lawyer who's just about to start they need to know that they need to have expertise in many areas of law and uh, yeah sports law is not qualified that's what we can understand from this let's move to the next slide sports law stakeholders in india so now when we talk about sports law who are the people who will be dealing with there are professional athletes professional coaches and professional teams so let's take an example of an athlete virat kohli so anything that happens with virat kohli professionally in a legal capacity that would be a case for sports law so it could be let's say his 100 crore deal with puma and if there are any issues that arise from that deal it would be a case for sports law same goes for coaches uh so for example ravi shastri his contract gets so let's say extended uh and then the, the terms of his contract will have legal obligations to follow so that would be another case of sports law related to coaches and then there are teams of course professional teams so we have like many teams in indian premier league ipl and when a team like rcb uh if it's about their formation of the team or ownership stakes all of that also will constitute for sports law case in india we have of course the uh, honorable supreme court high courts and subordinate courts they deal with uh, all the cases that go to the court uh, and they give their judgments and rulings and parties must follow them and then as a part of government of india we have ministry of youth affairs and sports they are the one who formulate general sports policies in india and then there's also an institute called sports authority of india it was set up with objective of promotion of sports and games uh, so that is also a big stakeholder when it comes to sports in india and then of course we have national organization such as indian olympic association and national anti doping agency so indian olympic association was formed as a result of olympic international olympic committee demanding an association association to be formed uh, for each country and so basically anything that that is related to olympics uh and if uh, india has to deal to in, if india has to do anything with that the indian olympic association will come in place and then of course we have some national sports federations uh, sporting governing bodies in india they have they hold incredible powers like some of them make their own decisions rules uh, so one of the examples would be bcci uh they are very powerful they 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 do not have any funding from the government uh so yeah these are the main sports law stakeholders in india now what i'm going to do is i'm just going to talk about some of my experience dealing with copyright trademark and sports policy so we will start with copyright first question is what is copyright um the legal right to control the production and publication of let's say a book play film photograph or piece of music that would be a copyright in sports when we talk about copyright in sports usually it deals with or it is applied to uh, the footage of match plays so both live and archival anything that is broadcasting like like for this webinar or if once it gets done you know when it get, gets into archival that who who owns this footage uh, is a question of copyright uh, so my work in bangalore was mostly related to anti piracy domain and our clients included international and national sports governing bodies and sports broadcaster channels so what we used to do there was we used to first identify copyright infringements so any rogue websites social media platforms or mobile applications that are streaming any illegal content Uh, we used to take actions against them. Uh, what we used to do was first we used to send these people cease and desist notices. Then there used to be a proper follow up. Uh, in case these people, like for example, a website or the servers on which the website is getting hosted, they do not listen to us, then we used to collect evidence against them and we used to then go to the court. So this is how the whole copyright identification and copyright Uh, taking action against copyright infringers this is how the process was in india uh, the copyright 
laws are governed according to the Copyright Act of 1957. And uh, in the United States, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, is the one uh, which has all the provisions for copyright in the United States. So this is just related to copyright. I'm also going to talk about trademarks. Uh, so let's start with what is a trademark. A name or a symbol which is on a, let's say, a product or service and it is an original work of a particular company, that would be a trademark. Trademark, the best example would be Nike, you know. Uh, no other company can use that Nike words or the, the Nike swoosh, tick mark logo other than Nike. So what this does is uh, this gives a value to a particular sports brand and there's a great need of trademark protection in the sporting world. Uh, many organizations have their own brand protection guidelines, guidelines sometimes like for example even when we are broadcasting this on Facebook, Facebook have its own brand and brand protection guidelines where they say how we can use the Facebook logo. So these are the guidelines in which there are permissible and non-permissible uh, usage of the logo and marks are given properly. And in my work here also, we worked with, you know, uh, first I work was to identify trademark infringements. So we worked with an IPL team basically. And what we used to do was go through e-commerce websites and social media platforms. And we used to see if any product or uh, any company is violating uh, this IPL team's logo to sell their, let's say, jersey or promote their uh, screening or whatever it is. Sometimes the client also used to inform us about the same and then we used to take action against these guys accordingly. Uh, how we used to take this action was usually these social media platforms or e-commerce websites have a procedure. We usually have to submit a form where we give details about the trademark and how it is violating the permissible use of the trademark. And uh, usually uh, we used to get a great compliance uh, in trademark cases we used to have like almost 100% compliance uh, where, uh, yeah, I mean, when, when you talk about copyright and trademark violations, trademarks are easier to follow. Uh, in India, trademarks are uh, look after Trademark Act of 1999. And if you want to register a trademark or if you have any uh, issues related to trademark, uh, you'll have to go to the Controller General of Patents, Designs and Trademarks. Okay, then. After sports law, sorry, after trademark, I'm just gonna talk a bit about sports policy making. So what is a policy? A policy is a set of ideas or a plan of what to do in a particular situation, agreed to officially by a group of people, a business organization, a government, or a political party. So uh, when I worked in Bangalore, I, as I mentioned before, I worked for this organization called the Sports Law and Policy Center. It is a think tank. And if you ask me what is the purpose of these think tanks, it is basically, uh, they are the research institutes. They do research work and publish articles, studies, and even help in drafting legislations. Uh, very few cases, but yeah, that also happens. And uh, then this information is used by organizations and governments to create sports policies. Uh, when I was in Bangalore, uh, there was a group of people who worked on Karnataka State Sports Policy and uh, in this policy there were just different studies that were done and different recommendations that were made. For example, how many football stadiums are needed in the state or how do uh, the state makes the most of the funding that comes from the central government or how to include more women and children in sports. So policy making is a mixture of all these things and uh, sometimes uh, like in parliament, a lot of lawmakers, they introduce different sports bills. Uh, for example, last year, the sports online gaming and prevention of fraud bill 2019 was introduced to regulate the online gaming industry in India. Uh, so when this sports bill gets accepted, uh, it can turn into a law. So this is how sports policy making in general works. Uh, one of the most interesting thing is like, these official documents you see, like for example, if BCCI releases an uh, official document or uh, let's say FIFA has an official document, uh, before they make this document, 
usually there's a think tank or a people expert a group of experts who think and discuss and then create these documents so when you think of sports policy making also think about official documents that are released by the sporting governing bodies okay uh off. now i'm just going to move into tennis because we have a very few limited time and i'm going to give you some examples from the tennis world so i will talk about an interesting case of nike and roger federer logo uh, when you think of sports law in this uh, you would think about trademarks and contracts so basically uh, if you are a tennis fan you would probably recognize this logo uh, you've probably seen it somewhere it was used by roger federer on his nike apparel for like more than a decade in 2018 roger federer moved from nike to uniqlo for a apparel deal of 300 million us dollars and when we looked online searches showed this rf logo was registered by nike so there was a question of if this logo which was registered by nike but it is of course uh, is it is to demonstrate roger federer himself uh, what what about the trademark right here uh, so what we got to know was uh, nike did not own the rights to its in perpetuity so they did not transfer the logo back to federer immediately uh, they decided to sell all their nike stuff that has this rf logo and in 2020 federer received the logo back uh, and now since roger federer has this logo back uh, it is most likely will appear on all his sponsor branding including uniqlo so this is the case of trademarks and contracts uh, here rf that roger federer that insignia is a trademark and the whole, the whole usage here uh, was because of different contracts roger federer had with nike or now with uniqlo so this is just one example of trademarks and contracts with the Roger Federer example. I will talk about Maria Sharapova's doping case now. Uh, in 2016, Maria, Maria Sharapova was found guilty of doping for taking meldonium. Uh, meldonium drug was legal before 1st January 2016. Sharapova took, it, uh, took that drug for almost a decade. So it wasn't a problem before, but since 2016, it was a problem. And this was overlooked by Sharapova and she continued taking it. So she was found guilty of doping and then she was handed two years doping ban. The doping ban was given by International Tennis Federation. Uh, and then that's when Sharapova defended herself saying, warning about changes to anti-doping rules weren't communicated effecti effectively enough to her. Uh, and the CAS, which is the Court of Arbitration for Sports, actually listened to her and then they reduced her ban from 24 months to 15 months. And she made a comeback on tennis circuit in 2017. So this is another sports law issue uh, about doping violation and jurisdiction. Maria Sharapo, Maria Sharapo is a Russian player. Uh, the CAS, which is the Court of Arbitration of Sports, is based in Switzerland. Uh, but what happens is when an athlete like Maria Sharapova, who is under contract with WT and ITF, uh, if she fails to doping here, she has to go by the rules of WADA, International Tennis Federation, and then CAS. And hence, uh, this jurisdiction is complicated, but this is how most international sports law cases work. So this is a very interesting case. And then there's uh the latest that is the atp wta merger talk so people who follow tennis they would know atp is the association of tennis professionals and wta is women's tennis association these are two sporting governing bodies in tennis atp is for men's professional tennis and wta is for women's tennis uh, women's professional tennis last month actually what happened was billy jean king joined roger federer and rafael nadal in suggesting now is the time to merge the men's and women's organization under one umbrella organization. Uh, there was a lot of uh, debate about if it's a good move or not. Uh, and some of the questions were related to equal pay. Uh, tennis is one of the sports where uh, there's equal pay at the highest level. Uh, for example, Grand Slams, all four Grand Slam uh, distribute the same amount of money for the champions, runners up, 
uh, across all four Grand Slams. Uh, in fact, this case uh, was pointed out by U United uh, States women's national team uh, for their equal pay fight with their governing body, uh, that is US soccer. So this is all very interesting when it comes to equal pay. Now, when ATP and WTA talks are happening right now, there will be a question of uh, if they will merge together uh, with 50-50% uh, ownership or if there will be some other kind of arrangement. So again, this more about the mergers and also when it talk, talks about equal pay, about price distribution and all that comes under labor law. So in general, this is how uh, sports law cases emerge. Uh, I hope I've made you understand at least a little bit of what sports law is. I'm really sorry I had to, uh, you know, run through these slides real fast because I, you know, I didn't have time and there were some technical difficulties before. But I hope you have a fair idea of what sports law is now. If you have any questions, I'm guessing you'll have many questions now. You can leave them in the comment right now, or you can just write to me on my uh, email ID that is sports at abhijitdangar.com, uh, or you can get in touch with me through Instagram on Ernest underscore sports. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, once again, really sorry for the technical difficulties and how I have to just run through the slides. Uh, but I hope we can do this again, uh, and next time there won't be any technical difficulties, and I'll have plenty of time. Thank you so much. So now, yeah, in case you have any uh, questions, please uh, leave them in the comment. Okay, um, so Bhatia has a question about patents. So yeah, like how I said previously, when it comes to sports, usually we deal with copyright and trademark. That is the majority of work. Uh, I myself haven't dealt with patents, but usually patent will come in, say, let's say there's a sports app and the application has a unique code uh, by which the software was built. Then the person who has built that application can file for a patent. And again, for that patent uh, to be accepted, the design has to be original. And once uh, they get the patent, uh, then of course, uh, nobody else can use it. Or if they have to use it, they have to take permission uh, of that particular uh, person, particular organization. Uh, that's how patents work. Uh, and if someone uses, makes an illegal use of that patent, it will be challenged by that particular person in the court of law. All right, I think that's it. Uh, I do not see any other questions. But in case if you have any more questions, please write to me on my email, which I've given here, and then I will get back to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, once again, sorry for the technical difficulties. And I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.